I'd next like to introduce Professor Matt Rimmer, Professor of IP and Innovation Law, obviously well known to everyone here, um, organiser of this conference, uh, to talk about digital copyright in these agreements. Thank you very much, Jane. It's lovely to have you back here. Um, you were such a joy to have last year in terms of sharing your knowledge and mentoring all our researchers. It's a great pleasure to have you back. And also, thank you very much for uh, participating in our QT Law Review uh, special edition on plain packaging of tobacco products. Where will we get tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> um, my talk today is looking at RCEP, copyright law, the digital economy, and the Pacific century. Um, and our uh, media team at QUT decided to, uh, to run with a press release talking about a Pacific Rim um, power shift. And it certainly put me in mind of what a good place Brisbane is to talk about some of the battles about copyright law and trade in the Pacific Rim. Um, because in the legal district of Brisbane, we've been shooting the sequel to Pacific Rim and um, pretending that it's uh, Tokyo. And very conveniently, somewhat closer to QT, we'd be pretending that um, the other part of Brisbane is New York. Uh, Chris Hemsworth and Tom Hiddleston have been attracting huge crowds as they shoot Thor Ragnarok um, 3. Um, and in some ways, I think it's a kind of a nice little metaphor to begin my presentation. There's a big debate about whether or not Australia is a proxy for Hollywood in some of the copyright debates or whether Australia is much more um, committed to uh, an Australia first policy in relation to intellectual property and trade. Uh, and I think, I think the big clash of the Pacific Rim film itself kind of captures some of the titanic battles that Jane has been uh, addressing in terms of big IT companies and uh, big old copyright industries slugging it out in terms of these uh, trade agreements. Um, much like uh, Dr. Shira Armstrong, my beginning point is the kind of the trumping of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, President Donald Trump was able to win the last election in part um, drawing upon uh, a deep antipathy to some of the neoliberal trade proposals being put forward by the Obama regime. There was a Midwest Brexit in the United States which helped facilitate the victory of uh, Donald Trump, and one of his um, first executive decisions was to withdraw the United States from the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations. Nonetheless, I do think that the shadow of the United States is still cast over the new RCEP negotiations, particularly because of the participation of so many of the major multinational companies based in the United States both in terms of old media, publishing, film, um, the music industry, but also um, some of the new media companies that Jane was talking about. Trump's own position in relation to intellectual property and trade seems quite uncertain at this stage. Um, he's withdrawn from the TPP, which had this IP maximalist chapter. Uh, on matters of copyright law, he seems to have disaffection to both Silicon Valley and Hollywood, uh, because he seems to feel that he's been snubbed by those kind of industries. So it's very unpredictable to determine uh, what route he'll take in relation to copyright law. On trademark law, he seems to be something of a trademark genius and is very interested in trademarks and branding and marketing. So perhaps we'll see under Trump a new enthusiasm for trademark law. On patent law, Trump has been very confusing after kind of running on a hard agenda of addressing drug prices. Uh, this week, he's been proposing patent term extensions. Um, and there's been a lot of debate about whether Trump's administration is recycling uh, some of the old TPP proposals in new agendas like the renegotiation of NAFTA and some of the bilateral deals that have been unproposed um, with, with other countries like Japan. Um, so the rise of the uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership in that context um, is a really important new uh, forum in which some of these debates about intellectual property and trade can play out. Um, and I guess there's been a lot of debate about the intersection between RCEP and the TPP. 
And our first two speakers have kind of pointed out some of the differences in terms of structure and process and substance. Um, but there's, in some ways, um, a much wider spectrum of uh, positions in terms of the RCEP debate, given some of the contrast between some of the countries. Some countries like Japan have been pushing for a TPP agenda in relation to intellectual property, um, in relation to RCEP. Uh, some countries like China um, have a very complicated position in relation to intellectual property. After having trade challenges by the Bush administration, uh, China has invested heavily in intellectual property, in copyright and trademarks and patents, and is very well prepared for future trade wars in relation to intellectual property. Um, so China's position is a very complicated one. Uh, and you have other kind of key players like um, Korea um, and Singapore, um, who have uh, particular strategic interests in some very high-tech industries. Uh, but then you have countries like India, who have often kind of pushed for a public interest agenda in relation to intellectual property. And then you have a range of ASEAN states who are much more kind of concerned about a development agenda in relation to intellectual property. Um, so it's a very kind of messy scenario in relation to the negotiations over intellectual property in relation to RCEP. And that might help e explain um, the very contested text of the leaks that we've seen thus far. Uh, much like um, the United States has kind of changed tack in relation to trade, um, there has been a kind of significant shift um, in terms of our new Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull and his approach to trade. While uh, Tony Abbott was very much concerned about uh, Australia's open for business approach, and took a very hardline copyright maximalist approach uh, in relation to some of the matters of intellectual property. Um, Malcolm Turnbull has made some subtle shifts in terms of his kind of particularly unique approach in relation to intellectual property and trade and innovation policy, and in particular trying to link um, those areas together in certain sorts of ways. Uh, in June of 2017, the Prime Minister discussed regional trade in his keynote address at the Shangri-La Dialogue, um, and he kind of expressed disappointment at Trump's uh, retreat um, from the TPP, and Turnbull uh, has been signalling that he's been keen to try to resurrect the TPP in some form or way, uh, but he also kind of made a big pitch for Australia playing a leadership role in RCEP and highlighting Australia's um, engagement with the region, saying that, you know, during the last decade we secured the ASEAN Australia New Zealand Free Trade Agreement, still ASEAN's most comprehensive trade agreement. That agreement has in turn inspired the drive for an even bigger prize in the form of RCEP, which will also bring in China, Korea, Japan and India. And moreover, the Prime Minister highlighted the importance of the digital economy in the region the internet and the digital technologies that has enabled a breaking down national boundaries and distance. Billions of people now have in their pocket a device that potentially connects them to everyone else in the world. In comparison to Tony Abbott, um, Malcolm Turnbull has shifted stance of the uh, coalition in relation to copyright law in some important ways. He's shifted portfolio responsibility of copyright away from the Attorney General George Brandis to the Communications Minister, Mitch Fifield. Um, he's been willing to kind of contemplate uh, new legislation, which has just passed through Parliament with some reforms to copyright exceptions in certain sorts of ways. Uh, but really, he's kind of interested in trying to reconcile uh, copyright law in terms of protecting creative industries and copyright law as part of, of his innovation agenda, his ideas boom. Uh, so I think that kind of informs Australia's approach to RCEP in certain sorts of ways and perhaps explains uh, the tack that Australia has been taking in the negotiations. In response, the Australian Labor Party um, has taken the position that the TPP is dead. Um, there's no point pursuing it without the involvement of the United States. 
The Shadow Minister for Trade in the past week has um, been complaining about the lack of transparency in relation to trade agreements. He's been lamenting the lack of economic modelling um, before negotiations are entered into in relation to the TPP and RCEP and other deals and the lack of transparency of the negotiations. And he could have made the case that there needs to be much greater emphasis upon open government in terms of dealing with trade agreements. Um, the Greens have been um, quite concerned about trade agreements, particularly with investment clauses associated with them. On copyright law, they've kind of tacked between two subtly different positions. Senator Scott Ludlam has been very keen on an expansion of copyright exceptions and drafted a bill on fair use. Um, but some of the other members of the party are sometimes much more sympathetic to creators' rights uh, of one kind or another. Uh, <coughs> the next Xenophon team kind of plays a very kind of key role in terms of the current Australian Senate. Um, they've been very kind of concerned about dud trade deals and they have demanded greater accountability in relation to trade deals. Uh, but interestingly enough, their members have been very sympathetic to some of the concerns of copyright owners in terms of uh, dealing with stronger rights and remedies in relation to copyright law. So it's quite a kind of complicated political situation at the moment in terms of how Australia deals with intellectual property and trade. The other point to say in terms of thinking about the Australian kind of context is that we've had a bevy of law reform inquiries thinking about copyright law, consumer rights and competition policy. Um, my colleagues, um, Associate Professor Nick Souza and Dr Kylie Papalado have been looking at the IT pricing inquiry and doing some updated research on some of the impacts of, of copyright law in relation to consumer rights and competition policy. The Australian Law Reform Commission made a strong case that Australia needed to modernise its copyright exceptions to deal with big data, cloud computing, search engines, 3D printing um, and the new innovation economy. Um, the Harper Review emphasised that there's a greater need to connect our discussions about intellectual property with competition policy. And the Productivity Commission um, engaged in a very kind of comprehensive review of Australia's intellectual property arrangements. Um, and they are very concerned about evidence-based policy making, both at a domestic level and at an international level. And they are very concerned about having a, a better alignment between Australia's domestic stances on copyright law and other fields of intellectual property and our international negotiating positions. And they made a number of recommendations for ways in which Australia could reform its intellectual property regime um, to promote efficiency and adaptability and community welfare. And I think it would be useful from an Australian perspective to connect some of the domestic policy discussions that have been going on and uh, the international spaghetti bowl of discussions that have been happening in relation to intellectual property and trade. From a civil society perspective, we've been very much dependent upon the kindness of strangers uh, to gain a glimpse into the content of uh, RCEP and some of the other trade agreements. So Knowledge Ecology International, which is based in the US and the European Union, have leaked versions of the intellectual property chapter and the investment chapter, which we'll be kind of talking about in various different ways over the day. Um, but that's a very kind of time-pacific moment in terms of what has been leaked. Um, the text gives some indications in terms of party positions, but it doesn't necessarily give us any idea in terms of the final um, positions in terms of some of those discussions. And I guess it's worth uh, thinking about uh, greater opportunities for transparency in relation to trade agreements. If the negotiations are going to be leaked anyway, why not introduce a kind of an open access approach in relation to trade? In other multilateral fora, like the World Intellectual Property Organization and UNCTAD and UNESCO, there's a much more kind of open discourse about international trade agreements. Uh, touching upon intellectual property information technology, surely we can have a bit more transparency and openness um, in Australia. Uh, so a lot of civil society organisations in the space, like the Electronic Frontier Foundation, have been calling for um, 
a reform of the way in which we negotiate trade agreements. Um, there's a very interesting statement of public interest principles for copyright protection under RCEP, uh, talking about trying to integrate public interest concepts into the negotiations over copyright law, but also boosting transparency and instituting various changes in relation to copyright law. Um, and domestically, it should be said that, you know, Afternet, um, led by uh, the very energetic Dr. Pat Ranald, who's here today, uh, has been very busy in terms of engaging in discussions both over the process of trade negotiations in Australia, but also in terms of some of the substantive impacts uh, um, of those agreements. From an IP perspective, a lot of the debates over the substance of the IP chapter um, have really addressed what sort of protection, what sort of standards will be in place. Will the deal just be a TRIPS model? Will it be a TRIPS plus model, like the Australian United States Free Trade Agreement? Or will it be a TRIPS double plus model, like the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement or the Trans-Pacific Partnership? And really the text that we've seen is a strange pastiche of <coughs> lots of different models. Um, uh, and in terms of just kind of briefly kind of covering the kind of smorgasbord of options, um, really RCEP um, covers a whole host of copyright doctrines. And it's always very kind of challenging about talking about uh, trade agreements and copyright law uh, because you have to kind of go through the whole history of an evolution and progression of copyright law to kind of get a sense of what's going on. Um, so I just want to go over a quick snapshot of some of the things that are under discussion, including public policy, economic rights, collective management, digital locks, government software, copyright limitations and exceptions, broadcast copyright, inventory liability, and there's also some questions there in terms of copyright enforcement and development, and some larger issues about the intersection between intellectual property and investor state dispute settlement. At a very kind of basic level, I think there's a big debate going on at the moment about the philosophical objectives underpinning copyright law in trade agreements. Copyright law was meant to initially promote uh, learning and the progress of science and the useful arts and access to knowledge and education. Um, but increasingly, um, various other demands have been placed upon it. So there's often been a very strong author's rights discourse emphasising moral rights. Um, big um, entrepreneurs and uh, distribution entities have argued that copyright law should serve certain objectives in terms of providing secure investment. Um, and then there have been concerns about consumer rights and competition policy uh, and larger concerns about the interaction between copyright law and innovation policy. One of the very good things that the Australian Law Forum Commission does in its um, report and the Productivity Commission does in its report is consider uh, a modern account of the array of public policy objectives that copyright law is meant to serve. And I think they could be helpful in informing some of our negotiations in relation to copyright law. The big takeaway from the Productivity Commission report is really the kind of the question of Australia um, really being a net importer in relation to copyright works. And that has been um, further accentuated after the Australian United States Free Trade Agreement in 2004. Um, and it's a very kind of stark contrast at the moment in terms of the balance of trade um, between imports and um, exports for Australia in relation to copyright goods and services. And the Productivity Commission kind of emphasises that's why we need to take into account evidence in terms of determining our optimal position in relation to copyright law and trade agreements. Uh, in terms of economic rights, there's a whole host of economic rights kind of covered in terms of RCEP. I think one of the pleasing things about RCEP is that it doesn't make any demands in the draft that we've um, seen in the most recent iteration in terms of copyright term extension, um, as Dr. Philip Vidi um, has shown and, and Dr. Shira Armstrong has also kind of explored, copyright term extensions have been incredibly costly. It's good to see that the Turnbull government passed amendments to deal with some of the issues in relation to unpublished works in Australia to give them a finite term this year. 
but that remains a very kind of live issue and concern and debate in Australia. Other countries in the region like New Zealand um, have live plus um, 50 in terms of their term. So just kind of, um, kind of covering some of the other areas uh, dealt with in terms of the agreement. There's text on collective management and copyright collecting societies. And I think a lot can be done to promote open, transparent and accountable <coughs> copyright collecting societies. Um, there's been huge controversies in Australia over screen rights, um, battling with the Writers Guild over distributions. And there's been a lot of debate over the copyright agency diverting funds meant for authors to a fighting fund to oppose the introduction of fair use um, in Australia. Um, and perhaps more could be done in terms of the region, in terms of ensuring better transparency and accountability in terms of copyright collecting societies. There's been huge controversies about digital locks and technological protection measures and electronic rights management information. Um, obviously, Japan has been a key player in terms of this debate. Um, in Australia, um, Sony kind of played a very key role in the Stevens versus Sony High Court of Australia battle over the definition of technological protection measures. Um, Japan, with its video games uh, industry, is very concerned about providing strong protection in relation to digital locks and electronic rights management information. Other countries perhaps have reservations and caveats and concerns about such measures. And indeed, some like Cory Doctorow argue that we should abolish digital locks altogether. Um, obviously, there's also been a lot of interest from some of the big computer software companies to have grey protection in relation to things like government use of software. Uh, but really one of the significant areas of debate is um, the scope of copyright limitations and exceptions. And there's some interesting efforts in terms of the text to try to provide a broad approach in terms of copyright limitations and exceptions. Some countries are much more progressive than others, so Korea has a very flexible approach in terms of its copyright exceptions. In Australia, though, there's been a great grievance um, from some quarters that we only have a defence of fair dealing rather than a much more expansive defence of fair use. Um, and there's been a push by the Australian Law Reform Commission and others to have a much more expanded, open-ended, flexible defence of fair use. So Pat Ofterheide, who was visiting QUT, was doing research in Australia on the impact of a limited defence of fair dealing upon the um, creative industry. Um, Wikipedia has been leading the charge for broadening the defence of fair use. And the ACCC has said that fair use reforms are essential in a world of technological change. But as I discussed before, the copyright industries have been opposing um, such changes and such moves. Uh, in New Zealand, it's been very curious that the National Party of New Zealand have pushed for a um, copyright maximalist agenda both at home and in international agreements, um, but they have uh, struck um, something of a controversy with NMM, suing them over one of their election adverts. And there's been a very amusing case in Wellington in which uh, New Zealand judges and lawyers have been passing the meaning of NMM's work and lyrics and musical work and uh, whether or not the National Party's advert called m uh, is an infringement of that particular work. Amongst other things, it shows the limitations of New Zealand's uh, defence of fair dealing and Professor Alexandra Sims and others have argued that New Zealand should have a defence of um, fair use. And John Oliver has, has taken uh, this case up with some enthusiasm. There's also other things that have been smuggled into the agreement, like a broadcast copyright provision. Um, so the WIPO has had a lot of debate about broadcast copyright, uh, unable to reach a conclusion. The Electronic Frontier Foundation has been concerned about the inclusion of those measures. Lots of debates about intermediary liability, both domestically and internationally. Um, from an Australian perspective, there's been a lot of concern about the narrow scope of our safe harbours provisions, which are limited to telcos and ISPs, and a lot of the big IT companies have been very concerned about that. Um, but also, um, start-up companies like Redbubble have been concerned that they've been exposed to actions for copyright infringement uh, because of the narrowness of the um, safe harbours action. So Redbubble have been sued by Hell's Angels 
in Australia um, for trademark infringement and copyright infringement. Um, Australia has also had a lot of controversy about the introduction of site blocking. RCEP also has some measures on enforcement and, and development. I guess from my perspective, the great weakness of the regime is that it doesn't really do enough in terms of thinking about the IP and development agenda. Just to wrap up, um, my kind of conclusion is that there are a number of different scenarios in terms of how RCEP could evolve. As Peter Yu kind of comments, one scenario could be that there's no IP chapter at all, um, that it's too controversial, it's too hard to bridge all the differences between the countries, and there'll be no IP chapter, or at most there'll just be a TRIPS-style IP chapter. Another model is that there'll be a TPP, um, TRIPS double plus agenda, led by Japan and Korea and Singapore and Australia and New Zealand. A third scenario is that perhaps there will be um, an in-between model, a TPP light model. So India and China and some of the middle powers will prevail and there will be some sort of in-between position that will recognise the importance of copyright law and intellectual property in terms of trade, but also take into account some of the concerns about development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.